everybody in the audience that we're broadcasting this, so um, mind your language, I guess, is the appropriate thing. And uh, we wanted to get this started, so hopefully the broadcast is going to start here in a couple of minutes or seconds. Um, this is a workshop for the Section 57 writer that we have in the General Appropriations Act to report on your four most popular degree plans. Um, and thank you for listening in. Hopefully this will be helpful. Um, there is an email. Should be an email coming up. An email address will be across the banner of the presentation so that you can email in questions and we'll respond to those during the presentation. Okay. So, um, and I'm Susan Brown, Assistant Commissioner for Planning and Accountability. Uh, I'm Dr. Van Davis, the uh, Director of Special Projects in uh, Workforce Academic Affairs and Research. And I'm briefly going to go over a few of um, the reason why we're meeting here, which is obviously Rider 57. And um, next slide. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the institute. It has requirements for the institutions and it has requirements for the coordinating board. Uh, the institutional requirements include doing the cost study, which is obviously the majority of the work, uh, and it's for your four most populous, popular degree programs defined by the institution. So it does not give the authority to the coordinating board to define, to say how you are going to define those programs. It also says they have to be a it's, my mic is still on, so hopefully you can still hear me. It sounds like it went away. Can you still hear me out in the audience here? Okay, we'll try that. Okay, um, it, it also says that um, it's looking at the cost of putting those programs 100% online. Um, we will have to take the data that each of you submit and do and evaluate the probable student outcomes, determine the most effective and effect, efficient and effective programs, and notify each institution. So after we do our report, we will actually submit it back to you so that you can um, make comments that we can then incorporate into the final report that goes to the, to the legislature. So um, that's basically the overview of the rider. We're trying to do it. We have already been asked by some legislatures during hearing when they'll get the report. Everybody is looking forward to getting it. So we want to make sure that we um, represent correctly as much of this as we can, giving them the dollars. There's a big focus on online. Obviously, there's a push with the uh, Western Governors Texas um, University coming in. So there's a big push and a lot of people are interested in what we can do online versus face-to-face -face and to open up access to a lot of more students and how useful this would be and what can be done in those methods. So I'm going to, at this point, turn it over to Paul and Van and let them kind of go through more of the steps. So um, the writer requires institutions to provide us cost information on the cost of the four most popular degree programs that would go online. Um, the first thing that the, that the institutions are asked to do is to determine themselves how they're going to define popularity. Uh, and if you look at the... Um, the wording of the writer, it's very explicit that it's up to the institution to determine what constitutes its four most popular programs. And that's why the coordinating board has not provided institutions with any guidance on that. The writer's very explicit that that's an institutional choice. One of the things that um, we want to make sure that we do in this report is to provide the legislature at least with an idea of, first of all, what institutions believe would be the programs that might encounter the highest demand for distance education. We understand that it may not be appropriate for all of those programs to be offered online. Unfortunately, the wording of the rider doesn't take that into consideration. 
In an effort to do that, though, and to be able to provide the legislature with not just information about probable cost, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but also provide them with some information about popularity of programs and to speak to the effectiveness piece. Um, we've asked institutions to indicate to us whether or not they believe that their four most popular programs would be effectively offered online. Now, that does not mean if you determine that a, a, a program cannot be effectively offered online. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that you don't have to also provide cost data. Uh, if, again, if you look at the, the wording of the rider as it was written, it provides no exceptions. Um, to providing cost data for us. So even if you determine that one of your four most popular degree programs could not be effectively offered online, unfortunately you still have to provide us with the estimated cost data. But um, because the writer instructs us to speak to efficiency, cost effectiveness, um, and overall effectiveness of the degree programs. This is one of the ways that we want to try to address that. We want to make sure that in the information that we provide the legislature that we've been able to um, do a diligent job of saying, you know, of the programs that institutions have indicated, there are some that they believe could be effectively offered online and there are some that they believe could not be effectively offered online. And we believe that that's significant information for the legislature to hear as well as the possible cost information as well. Um, in addition, um, as we begin to try to look at efficiency and cost, um, we're also asking institutions to uh, provide us with a methodology of how you calculate cost. Uh, we recognize and understand that for every institution out there, there is most likely a different way that you are um, tracking or not tracking cost of distance education. Uh, we understand that this is something that many institutions um, have not been tracking. It's something that the Nakubo accounting standards don't take into consideration yet. Uh, and again, we know that that means that we will see a wide variety in the way that institutions determine the cost that they, uh, data that they provide us with. We've been very clear um, in uh, the Senate Higher Ed Committee um, hearings last month whenever this report came up and the cost of distance education came up that one of the things that we really believe that we can begin to do with this report is, is not provide um, the actual cost because we do know that that's going to vary depending upon how an institution is accounting for it. But what we do believe that we can do here is that we can begin to um, provide the legislature with information on the ways in which institutions are calculating cost of distance ed. And we can use that as a way of beginning to work with institutions to try to develop a common cost methodology. Um, we know that based upon the questions that have come to us from legislative offices, the questions that have come to us from other state agencies, uh, we've seen the auditors do a report now on distance education at universities, the comptroller's office is in the process of doing a report on distance education, the legislative budget board is in the process of doing a report on distance education at community colleges, uh, we've already seen um, higher uh, uh, interim charges for both Senate higher education as well as House higher education dealing with distance ed, that this is an issue of great interest now across the state, amongst, especially amongst legislators and other state agencies. So we want to be able to try to work with institutions to develop a way of beginning to get a better handle on what the actual costs of distance education are, especially since distance education is oftentimes being spoken about in these settings as a cost efficiency measure. So that's one of the other things that we're attempting to do in this rider is not come up with definitive costs of this is how much it would cost, but rather begin to um, indicate what a common cost methodology might include and start working with institutions to develop that. Um, one of the other things, though, that we have asked very specifically for in this report uh, 
is learning management system costs. We're aware that many of the institutions across the state are using um, the same learning management system. We're also aware that that learning management system uh, oftentimes costs vastly different things uh, for those institutions because different prices have been negotiated. And so this is also an attempt to begin to try to get a handle on what learning management system costs might be so that we can make some recommendations about where some cost savings might take place if we could begin to leverage uh, a greater scale uh, in terms of buying power. So that's one of the reasons why that learning management system cost has been requested. I want to go back real quickly though and, and step back and talk about effectiveness um, for just a moment again. Um, the writer asks us to report on um, efficiency and effectiveness. It's difficult, you know, one of the ways that we're trying to do that is, like I said, asking you to tell us whether or not you think that the programs that you identify would be effective. It's difficult, obviously, to try to determine the effectiveness of programs that may not yet exist. Um, so one of the ways that we're trying to approach this is also by saying that if there are programs that are doing well face-to-face, then these might be programs, no guarantee, but these might be programs that could also be more effectively placed online. And that's why we've asked you to provide us um, for both your existing online programs and even your face-to-face -face programs you've not placed online yet. It's one of the reasons why we've asked you to provide us with graduation rates and GPAs. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're trying to do with this report. Um, we are looking at trying to provide the legislature with some ideas of ranges of possible costs, of trying to begin to develop a common cost methodology so that we can provide more accurate data in the future when we're asked for it and when your own boards might ask you for it. Uh, and then we're also trying to look at if institutions are um, identifying certain programs as being most popular, then we're also in the position of being able to look at our own records and see how many online programs in those fields already exist, which will help us begin to speak to whether or not there might be a need for more online programs in this arena, or it may be that we have online offerings that would be very sufficient. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with this report. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to Paul, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, some of the expectations and also some of the common errors that we've found so far. Thanks, Van. Um, I got to say, we've had some pretty good success. Over a third of the institutions have responded successfully to the request, even though the, uh, the template seems a bit onerous. Um, we've had really a positive feedback. Probably another 20 institutions are waiting for this workshop to be over so that they can, they can make sure that their submissions are in line. Um, so we obviously are concerned about the other remaining number of institutions that, that haven't communicated to us one way or the other yet. But we're positive that we'll get a response and we'll be able to produce the report. In line with being able to produce the report, the really the only reason we're bouncing any of these templates back to the institutions is because the data that we've been provided uh, wouldn't allow us to do the analysis that we're required to do. Uh, we're trying to be as lenient as possible and as flexible in collecting the information so that, that you can do it. We realize that most of the institutions don't have an accounting system that actually keeps track of online costs so you're having to go through and allocate. We understand that's, that's one of the reasons that we are going ahead and taking down the methodology as well so that we get a radically different answer, we'll be able to try on our end to explain it and not have to come back and ask you questions. But do be forewarned if during the analysis um, the data doesn't make sense, doesn't line up, we're not just going to put it in the report and say it doesn't make sense, we're going to get back to you and we're going to ask you, hey, you're different than everybody else, what's driving that? So you get an opportunity to either correct or respond. Um, I don't know how many questions we've gotten so far. We've got about four or five. But to prime more, I'm going to go through this, this quick list of common reasons that we've bounced things back. 
Um, the first problem that, that we're having is some people are not noticing that there are four sheets in the template, or some people are doing what I expect, passing this out to the individual colleges that they've picked from those popular programs. Each one of those colleges is completing a template, and then they're sending us four templates back. It would be a huge benefit to us if you can combine those into one template. We're uploading this into a database, and it is a bit onerous for us to, to do that for all of the institutions. Um, it, it is essential. For the costing piece that, that we get the, um, the GPA and the graduation rates, the degrees, we need the current degrees if you currently have an online program or if the program, uh, we, if you don't have a current online program, we need your current face-to-face -face degrees. And there's a place to put the GPA for the face-to-face -face and the online for the face-to-face, -face, but in that rare instance where you have a hybrid program right now that's both online and face-to-face, -face, we want the degrees for the entire current program. We'll need those degrees, again, for the current and the projected. It's very important that we get projected degrees. Um, we're not going to be able to do a comparative analysis with the other programs if we don't get those. Uh, cost is absolutely essential. And while we've pre-populated the template with 18 or so combinations, you can put any combination you want in there as long as you identify the Nakubo cost category for us, which is very helpful. Uh, you can change the labels for the item itself and then give us the cost for both the current and the, and the, and the uh, projected cost. Startup costs are optional. If you currently have an online program, you wouldn't have any startup costs per se, unless of course you had some kind of augment to the program that you were planning. Um, so we, we're not going to be surprised if you don't have startup cost if your program is currently reporting online uh, graduation rate and online GPA. However, the, uh, the current wouldn't be required if it's face-to-face. -face. So the current would be for your current online program. But everybody should have a future year or projected costs for all the five years that we're asking for. That brings us into the nuances of the program. There are three types of programs that we're, we're getting responses on. We have the programs that are 100% face-to-face that have been selected. They have no online activity. Those are fairly straightforward for folks. They know that they need to do the startup cost and the projected costs. We have those programs that are currently online, and people understand they have to do the current. But we're getting responses back that don't have any projected costs on those, and we do need those. We'll have to return it to you if we don't get the future year costs for the currently 100% online programs. And then we have that anomaly where it's a mixed program. You might have a program where students are 100% online and a program, same program, where they're also 100% face-to-face, or you might have some hybrid. Those programs still need to be reported under the same restrictions, it's just you've got to fit them into the categories of whether it's current, startup, or projected costs. Um, this presentation that you're seeing here, it'll be on our website. If you go to www.thecb.state.texas.us slash ODPS, you'll be able to get to this presentation, and you'll also be able to get to the recording of this workshop if somebody at your institutions didn't get an opportunity to tune in but would like to see it. So some of the questions that we've gotten so far, um, we've received a couple of requests for being able to get the webcast and, and the slides, and, and Paul just gave you that URL. Um, we received a question of... Um, how is it that the effectiveness of a program is going to be measured? Is it strictly GPA? Um, for those programs that are being offered currently, to try to at least get a very quick idea of effectiveness, um, we're asking for GPA and graduation rates. Again, like I said, um, for programs that are going to be offered online, um, we'll be using sort of two measures of being able to try to determine what their effectiveness might be. Um, one is, will be based upon the um, answers that you give us to that question of, do you think that this degree program can be effectively offered online? And obviously, there are some programs that can be more effectively offered online than others. Uh, I doubt that we will see uh, any of the health-related institutions tell us that their medical degrees can be effectively offered online. Um, so we, we understand that 
that there are some of the programs that you may identify as your most popular degree program that cannot be effectively offered online and we want to make sure that we provide that feedback to the legislature in the report. Like I said though, unfortunately the wording of the rider still requires you to give us the estimated cost data. The other way that we will try to gauge what probable effectiveness is, is to look at what your current GPA and graduation rates are. As Paul said, if you're already offering that program online, you provide us with, the, you need to provide us with the current GPA and graduation rates for the online version of the program. If you're not currently offering that program online, um, you'll notice that the template asks you to provide us with the GPA and graduation rates for the face to face program. Uh, and we do need that information. Again, that will be a way for us to try to gauge um, potential effectiveness. It's not a, a perfect methodology, and we recognize that. Uh, but what we will be able to say is that, you know, based upon those metrics, that we see programs that um, have high graduation rates or high, have high GPAs face-to-face, uh, -face, then they might have uh, the potential for being more effectively offered online than a program that doesn't have a high GPA or graduation rate. And again, we recognize that that's not a perfect indicator, uh, but in terms of trying to address possible effectiveness of programs that do not yet exist online, we felt that this would be um, the easiest way for all of us to, to try to address that. Uh, one of the other questions that has come up so far, here. I know y'all are watching because I'm getting questions. So I'm going to read the question, I'm going to read this question that we've gotten um, from Grayson and, and Paul, I'll let you chime in on here. Uh, as you know, any degree has many specific course options for students. Even within the core, students may select from a variety of different courses within each component area. To this point, our institution has determined that the only fair way to assess cost effectiveness is to assume that every course a student might select for her degree plan be offered online. Otherwise, we would be offering a single route through our degree plan that is not viable for most students. Is this a good assumption? And I would say, say yes. We, we, are, we are looking for programs. We've specifically asked here for programs that can be offered 100% online and to assume that it would be offered 100% online. Um, again, we recognize that that doesn't necessarily follow the way that we normally have you report uh, what we would consider to be a fully distance ed degree program. But given the... Um, what we think the intent of the rider is, we believe it's 100% it's online programs and this way by making sure that we're talking about 100% and every we can make sure that everyone is talking about 100% and it will make it a little bit easier for that comparison. Uh, one of the other questions... Let me, that, let me make a comment. Sure. On that particular one where you've uh, included as many options for the students as possible, that's clearly going to drive the cost up for putting that, that plan online. That's very important that you put a comment down in your methodology to indicate how many of those courses that you felt like you needed to put online in order to get this plan online, 100%. Sorry. Uh, one of the other questions that we have has, that has come in has been about learning management systems. Uh, the spreadsheet asks for the cost of the learning management system. We have a learning management platform that involves many more pieces than the LMS, such as Turnitin, Integrity, etc. Uh, would you like us? Uh, would you like us to use the total L uh, learning management platform costs or just the learning management system costs? If at all possible, we'd like you to just provide us with the learning management system cost, that base cost. If for some reason uh, you do not feel like that you're able to um, disaggregate your platform cost to provide that, then please provide the platform cost. We'd rather have some number than no number. And then indicate uh, in the comments somewhere that that is the cost for your total learning management platform and not just the LMS system piece of that. Uh, one of the other questions uh, that's come in, and I'm going to let um, 
Paul answer this question. Uh, for the cost to be reported in the survey, should we be submitting the incremental cost to put online versus face-to-face -face or total cost to put online? It's total cost. Okay. Uh, we've had a question about how um, someone can access the template that we've been talking about. Uh, that template went out to your chief business officers and we also will have it online, correct? It's currently on that same web page. Again, our main web page slash ODPS. Okay. We will try to get that fixed. Uh, we've got a question here that if the cost is zero, uh, then should we just leave that cell blank? Please enter zero. That way we know that you just didn't forget to um, fill in that cell, and that will minimize the amount of time that uh, Paul and I have to harass you after the fact. Um, we've got another question here. We do not compensate for design and development. Um, so again, if you're not compensating for any of those cells or if there's no costs associated, just please go ahead and enter zero so that we know that um, the costs are actually zero there and not that you just have forgotten to put anything into that cell. Uh, and then I'm going to um, let Paul answer this one. On the template, where do we enter the degrees for the face-to-face -face programs? Also, do we use the FY 2011 degrees? Um, you need to enter the degrees for the face-to-face -face on the same line that you're entering the online. They're combined together. They're not separate reporting. And that's item 10. Okay. What's the same FY portion? Uh, do we use FY 2011 degrees? And yes, you do. So that is all of the questions that we, well, let me see. Nope. We've gotten a few more here. <laughs> all right. So we've got a question here about graduation rates. Um, in order for students to qualify for financial aid, we put every undecided student in our general studies degree plan. In other plans, students select a major for which they have not yet been accepted. Our graduation rate is enormously skewed by these quote unquote holding place majors. Do we report the graduation rate of those who are pursuing a specific degree plan or for all those who are enrolled in them regardless of their intention? A good question. <laughs> Very good question. I would say, um, number one, we, we would not know how you, if you give us those that actually intend to stay in that degree, you need to tell us how you determine that. If, whether they had to take 12 hours within that degree program before you counted them or how you developed that um, for the graduation rate. So we will accept it, but you need to tell us how you determined that they actually intended what that intent was. Uh, another question, online costs are indistinguishable these days between LMS costs uh, that are used in face-to-face -face classes. There is such a large component of LMS activity in every class we offer that it's impossible to separate the costs out for online classes only. Oration. Yeah, I would, in, if you're really lost on how to allocate your, uh, your LMS, just take a sampling of a given semester, look at how many students you had on the LMS that were face-to-face -face and how many students that were online. Maybe you'll do it by course. Maybe you'll look at how many students you have in courses that are face-to-face -face and how many students you have in courses that are online. Sum up the total course and just break out the percentage. It's rough. Put it down in your methodology and move forward. We've got another question about graduation rates. Do we place graduates that graduate at the end of the fourth year in year four? Our, I, our IR office views the reporting as being in the fifth year. Please clarify. I don't understand the question myself. I believe we're only asking for a six-year graduation rate. So all of those students would be included. I mean. We were actually, we were actually looking for an actual graduation rate. Um, so. But it's a six-year graduation, yeah, right? Yeah, usually. Yeah. Uh, another question that's come in. In community colleges, programs are often considered to, to 
be those that offer certificates. For many of us, those are the programs with the highest enrollment. In the survey, it appears that programs that offer degrees are the only programs that are options for consideration. Could you please clarify the role of certificates in this survey? Uh, if you're considering only degree attainment, are AS and AA degrees included? Yes, in this case, um, we read the rider to indicate only degree programs, not certificate programs. So we're asking only for degree programs. So that would be any associate degree program that you offer um, if you're at a community college or any bachelor's or master's or doctoral or special professional degree if you're at a university or a health-related institution. But we do not want uh, data on certificates. We believe that the rider is specifically asking for degree programs and not for certificates. Um, one of the other questions is, uh, what if the CIP code for the program we are turning in is not on the list? Uh, we are putting through one of our wind energy programs, cannot find the CIP code for that program. Um, if it's not there, then please just go ahead and, and indicate it. If, if you're having difficulty because it's a drop-down option, um, you can indicate it uh, in another portion of the comments where you can enter text. Uh, We've got another question here if the program is currently offered online, but we found that all of our students took at least one course face-to-face. -face. How do we report that? You would, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we would not see that as making a, a difference. You would still need to, uh, you can report it that, that it's currently being offered as a hybrid program, and here's what the anticipated cost would be for it to be offered as an online program um, over the next four years. I guess the question probably applies best to the GPA and the graduation rate. Uh, if you have students, you know, really want to see 100% online for that online graduation rate and that online GPA. So we, I guess we would prefer them put that in the face-to-face -face ban? Yes. Yep. So even if you have one or two courses that are face-to-face, -face, we want you to go ahead and report that as a face-to-face -face GPA and a face-to-face -face graduation rate. Um, so another question here, if it is impossible for a degree to be taught online, do the hands-on nature of the degree, for example, electronics, and it is one of the most popular, it should be included? My understanding from this workshop is it should be included, yes, and, and let me, let me re-emphasize that. If you believe that a program is one of your most popular programs and it cannot be effectively offered online, indicate that it cannot be effectively offered online, provide us with your reasoning for that, but you still must provide us with the anticipated cost data. The rider does not allow for any exceptions. So even if you do not believe that the program cannot be effectively offered online, we want that information. We want you to tell us that. We want you to tell us why. But you still must provide us with the anticipated cost data were you to try to offer it online. Okay. One of the other questions, uh, why, and I'm going to let Paul answer this one. Why doesn't the spreadsheet have a category for operations and maintenance of physical plant? Those are real costs even for online programs. Um, that's a good question. All right, I'll answer it. Yep. So when we um, created this spreadsheet, we first of all, one of uh, one of the ways that we did this, this didn't just sort of jump into existence with nobody looking at it. Um, we had lengthy discussions amongst about this, both internally um, with coordinating board staff, but also the Statewide Learning Technology Advisory Committee um, spent a great deal of time talking about this and providing feedback. One of the things that was decided as a result of those conversations was that there are really infinite numbers of ways in which potential costs could be sliced and diced. And there's a lot of different categories, and physical plant would be one of them. Um, we made the determination based upon the feedback that we got that we would not include that as a cost because what we heard was that it would be very difficult to calculate that and that um, the costs would most probably be fairly minor compared to what the costs of face-to-face -face would be in that case. So if you feel that it's important for you to include that, um, you've got those free cells at the bottom that ask for methodology. Um, feel free to include anything down there uh, 
in, in terms of other costs that you don't feel like are captured on the spreadsheet and that you think are really important costs, um, feel free to include that information there uh, where you describe your methodology and we will take that into consideration. Uh, and certainly as we move forward trying to figure out um, working with all of our institutions and our various committees, especially the Learning Technology Advisory Committee, um, certainly as we move forward trying to figure out what a more consistent uh, and effective way is of gauging cost of distance education, that's going to be information and feedback that we need. And, and like I said, that is one of the things that we hope that we're able to begin to do with this survey. Um, we're not going to be able to say based upon this survey and in this report. This is how we think that costs should be calculated. But we do see this as a first step in working with all of our institutions uh, to begin to figure out uh, a, an effective cost methodology because we have every indication that questions about the cost of distance education are, are not going to go away, that this is going to be a significant topic um, for the next few years. Uh, we've got another question here. Can we use a single cost line item for each functional category, i.e. student services, institutional support, academic support, and report costs along those lines? What about including an allocation of scholarship expenses? You can do that. Um, be, be prepared for questions. Uh, if we find something off on, on your particular numbers, we won't have as much detail, so we'll probably have to come back and ask you questions. Okay. Uh, somebody's pointed out that uh, the um, number cells on the survey will not accept a zero. Don't, please, don't go in and bother changing the physical properties to make it accept a zero. We, we really don't want you to spend an inordinate amount of time on this. Um, so if it won't accept a zero, just leave it blank, move on, and uh, we'll keep that in mind as we take a look at them. Um, Another question here about graduation rates. The THECB provides us with graduation rates for the iPads. Would that be a viable source that can be used to calculate graduation rates? Those graduation rates are not by discipline, so they would not um, provide you the right information for any single program. Okay. But that's, that's a good definition if you could, you know, for your cohort. Uh, we've got another um, question here. Obviously, institutions have been doing things on a string budget and trying to make things work, and that is not necessarily the right way to do it. For example, an institution said they do not compensate for course design and development. This is not necessarily how we should be designing online programs. So in trying to answer the survey, should we stick to the realities of our institutions or how things have been done in the past? or the correct way of doing this task and extrapolating the cost from that. We would like you to stick to the realities. Um, if you're managing as you are today, we want to get that level set because um, when you start to estimate what it should cost, not what it does cost, it leaves too much variability in the study and it would be very, very difficult to explain. So why we realize that a lot of the institutions are strained for resources and that these numbers are probably lower than what they should be by leaving it as it is today on the costs that you're working with today that makes it something that we can speak to. Um, we've got a, a question again about um, degrees awarded. Uh, do we place degrees awarded at the end of the fourth year in year four on the spreadsheet or in year five? I would say in year four. Yes, year four. four. Year four. Uh, okay. uh, we offer degrees that can be taken 100% online. However, our students graduate with a combination of online and face-to-face -face courses. We have no good way to determine the mix of these courses, so we don't know what percentage of the degree was actually taken online. How should we report the graduation rate? And I believe we've, we've responded to that. Um, if you believe that students are taking a mix of courses online and face-to-face, -face, for the purposes of this survey, please report that as face-to-face -face because it's, it's not 100% online. And uh, let's see, a couple more questions have come in. Um, should we use the iPads graduation, graduation rate, which is 150% or three years to graduate instead of six years? Do you understand that, Susan? Yes. 
Use the IPEDS definition. 150% of time for a bachelor's degree is six years, for a associate degree, three years. Okay, another question about uh, should we be submitting the incremental cost to put online versus face-to-face -face or total cost to put online? And I believe we've, we've already answered that. It's incremental. Incremental. Incremental no, no, cost. No, total. 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 I'm sorry. Total. total cost. Total cost. So total cost to put online. Um, Can I get into that a little bit? Yes, please. Yeah, I realize that makes this just a little bit harder, but if institutions were reported incremental costs for the programs once they go online, we'd have no way of comparing institution to institution or even plan to plan. So that's why we're asking for the total cost. Hopefully that'll help you shape what you put into costs. Okay. Uh, another question that's come in. On the instruction cost, hypothetically, if a degree has 85% of the courses available in various modes, including online, are the costs supposed to represent just the additional cost to offer the other 15% online or total cost for the entire degree online? Again, and total cost. And as we just said, total. Likewise, if we currently have a registration online and there would be no additional cost due to adding totally online programs, there would be nothing in this field. No, there would, there would be the portion that's associated with that projected plan. Okay. So, so if again, you have a certain number of degrees for this plan that you project and you have a total number of degrees, just allocate it out. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions here at the audience? And I don't seem to be getting any other questions um, through email right now. It's been a few minutes. Uh, we'll wait another couple of minutes to make sure that nothing else comes on. Um, as Paul said, um, the and we have it up here now, the website where the uh, presentation notes as well as the webcast uh, and the uh, template and instructions and all of the other information associated with the rider will be at uh, www.thecb.state.tx.us slash ODPS. It looks like we've got another question. No, nope, just a thank you. So if there aren't any other questions, um, we will wrap this up. You can, um, if there are other questions that come up. You can continue to email them uh, to myself, and uh, we will make sure that uh, either Paul or I uh, reply as quickly as possible. Um, again, we're providing you with some extra time to complete this, uh, August 30th. 30th. Yeah. Um, we would ask that when you do have it completed, 30. that you please go ahead and submit it um, Please don't wait until the last minute if you can help it, uh, because obviously we have a lot of them that we're going to have to go through, and as Paul said, uh, we're going to need to be able to spend some time uh, and being able to contact folks if we have any questions. Um, the template will... It may not be on the site right now, but we'll make sure that the template is up there. Um, and the presentation slides from the webcast will be on this site as well, so you'll have access to them as well. Um, the webinar, we will try to get the videotape of this up uh, within the next couple of days. We'll work with our IT to try to do that as quickly as possible. And uh, the rest of the site should be live when, Paul? by the end of today? I, I hope so. It should be live right now. I'm not okay. sure what the problem is. So the, the rest of the site should be live before the end of today. Um, hopefully within the next five or ten minutes we'll see what the problem is. All right. Thank you all very much. Again, if you've got further questions, um, you can email me. We'll make sure that somebody gets back to you. And uh, we know it's a difficult task. Um, feel free to understand that we're in the boat with you. And... Um, we will have to compile all of the results and uh, write the report. And we'll also make sure that each of you get a copy of that when we're completed. Thank you.